In the 2007 NBA draft, the Portland Trailblazers would pass up on one of the best players in the world. Today, we're breaking down what happened to some of the biggest names that this class had to offer, starting off with the first overall pick, who had the potential to be one of the top big men of the 2010s. Although I think it's pretty obvious, I'm going to let you guys decide if he's a bust or actually, you know what? He's a bust no matter how you look at it. It's Greg Oden on the Aliens. Now, for real though, Greg Oden had the potential. He was dominant on both sides of the ball, a solid finisher around the basket, and a great shot blocker. Some scouts thought he might turn into the next David Robinson or even Bill Russell. While there were some other players in this class that had the potential to be selected with the first overall pick, the Trailblazers chose Odin, but his career got off to a shaky start, and that's being generous. He missed the entirety of the 2007 season after undergoing microfracture surgery on his right knee and would have to make his return in the 2008 season, which would technically be his rookie year. I honestly feel really bad for this guy. Most YouTube videos out there probably have somebody bashing him for something you can't even control. You wait all that time to get your chance in the NBA, and right before it begins, it feels like everything is over in seconds. According to an article by the New York Times, Odin said sorry about 20 times to the GM Kevin Pritchard after coming out of surgery. That should just never be the case. Having just torn my ACL this past year, I know how hard stuff like that can be on your mental health. In his rookie season, though, he bounced in and out of the starting lineup, averaging 8.9 points, 7 rebounds, and 1.1 blocks per game. Unfortunately, injuries would once again make a dent in his season after missing three weeks due to a chip kneecap. Next season, Odin took over as the Trailblazer starting center, and things were finally starting to look up for him. But he would only be able to play in just over a quarter of the season, this time due to fracturing his left patella. The constant injuries to his knees had already taken a serious toll on Odin despite him only being 22 years old. He was forced to miss the next three seasons after undergoing various surgeries in hopes of repairing his knees. Over that three-year stretch, Odin was waived from the Trailblazers to make room on their roster, and in the 2013 offseason, he signed with the Miami Heat, who were coming off their second consecutive title. While there were still some who were hopeful that there was enough time for Odin to still turn his career around, this would not be the case. He was far from the dominant big man that he was coming into the league, and averaged just 2.9 points and 2.3 rebounds per game during his time with the Heat. Odin went down as one of the biggest what-ifs in NBA history. If it weren't for the injuries, he could have very well turned out to be great and led the Blazers to at least being contenders in the 2010s. I also found an article that said Odin hit at home because he felt like a failure after being cut. But life goes on, I guess, right? You play basketball? I used to. Oh, you used to? I can beat you. <laughs> Up at number two, we have a player who is looked at as one of the top talents of this generation and the best player of this draft class, hands down. Another player that many thought could have been the first overall pick in this draft class was Kevin Durant, and honestly, he should have been. In college, Durant had an extremely unique skill set, and some scouts really didn't know what to make of him. Being nearly seven feet tall, a lights out shooter, and just straight up being close to unguardable at the college level, it led to the Supersonics taking him at number two, and they would quickly be rewarded. He got off to a quick start, starting in all 80 games that he played in and averaging 20.3 points and 4.4 rebounds per game, earning him the Rookie of the Year award. Durant earned his first All-Star selection in the 2009 season, where he led the league with an average of 30.1 points per game, which ended up becoming a trend with Durant, leading the league in points per game three out of the next four seasons, establishing himself as one of the best scorers the game has ever seen and rivaling LeBron James as the best player in the world at the time. During that stretch, Durant led the team to their first NBA Finals appearance since their relocation to Oklahoma City in the 2011 season. Ironically, it was against LeBron and the Heat. They swept the Mavericks in the first round, beat the Lakers in five games in the second round, and sent the Spurs packing in six in the Western Conference Finals, which meant they were up against the Heat team who was coming off a Finals loss in the previous season, one that they were desperately itching to get back. Experience really played a huge factor in this series, and the Thunder ended up losing in five games. Along with the finals run, Durant won his first and only MVP during this five-year stretch. This came in the 2013 season where he averaged a ridiculous 32 points, 7.4 rebounds, and 5.5 assists per game. It appeared at the time that Durant would spend the entirety of his career in OKC and that the duo of him and Russell Westbrook 
were on the cusp of finally winning the franchise its second championship in team history. However, this would not be the case, and after blowing a 3-1 series lead to the Warriors, Durant made one of, if not the biggest moves in free agency that the league had ever seen, signing with those same Warriors who were coming off a 73-9 season. With Durant on the roster, Golden State had arguably the most talented group ever assembled and coasted to two straight titles. Durant took home the finals MVP in both of these series as well, and they were well on their way to a third straight ring, but Durant would suffer a calf strain in the Western Conference semifinals and rush back way too quickly just to get hurt in Game 5 of the finals against the Toronto Raptors. It's the right calf that put him out. I don't like to hear the fans, the Kyle Lowry, Pascal Siakam, Serge Ibaka telling the crowd, no, we are not going to cheer when this guy goes down. With the Warriors being extremely shorthanded with not only Durant out, but also Klay Thompson late in game six, they did not have enough firepower to win the series and pull off their three-peat. Despite all their success on the court, it was clear that there was some trouble in paradise with Durant and Draymond Green getting into constant arguments. In the offseason, Durant was moved to the Nets in a sign and trade that landed the Warriors' D'Angelo Russell. However, due to his Achilles injury, he was forced to miss the entirety of the 2019 season. Despite the Nets putting together a star-studded roster led by Durant, Kyrie Irving, and James Harden, injuries got the better of this team, leading to them never really getting a chance to have a healthy run at a championship. Midway through the 2022 season, Durant was on the move yet again, this time being traded to the Phoenix Suns. The Suns were a team that were already championship contenders at the time, and many thought the addition of Durant would be exactly what they needed to finally bring one home. However, once again, injuries would make it where all the stars didn't share the court for long before their backs were up against the wall in the playoffs. After a disappointing run and losing to the Nuggets in the second round, the roster would be shaken up with the Suns coming out with Bradley Beal. Durant is still one of the best scorers that the league has to offer, with him averaging around 30 points per game at the age of 35, which is unbelievable. Time will ultimately tell if the Suns have enough to finally win a championship, but KD has already established himself as one of the best players of this generation with or without him winning a third ring. Personally speaking, the Suns are going to have to play a lot better for me to see them standing any chance in the playoffs in this current season. Moving on to the third overall pick, we have yet another player who could have easily went first overall. Al Horford was one of the most dominant players in all of college basketball leading up to the draft. He led the Florida Gators to back-to-back -to -back national championships and already had a well-rounded out skill set on both sides of the ball. He was drawing comparisons to players like Horace Grant and Carlos Boozer, so the Hawks scooped him up with the third overall pick and almost instantly slid him into the starting lineup. He had a strong rookie year, averaging 10.1 points and 9.7 rebounds per game, earning him a spot on the all-rookie team. Horford made back-to-back all-star appearances in the 2009 and 2010 seasons, along with making his lone all-NBA team in that 2010 season as well. Despite suffering a couple of concerning shoulder injuries, Horford would end his time on the Hawks on a high note, making two more consecutive all-star appearances in his final two years with the team. While many thought it would be a no-brainer decision for the Hawks to bring him back in the 2016 offseason, they would opt to sign Dwight Howard instead, leading Horford to move on to the Celtics. He spent three years with the Celtics at this point in his career, picking up his fifth and final All-Star appearance in the 2017 season. In the 2019 offseason, Horford signed a four-year deal with the Philadelphia 76ers. However, after getting demolished in the playoffs, he was traded in the offseason to the Thunder. With Horford being 34 years old and the Thunder being a rebuilding team, they reached an agreement allowing him to sit out the remainder of the season after playing just 28 games, and in the 2021 offseason, he was traded back to the Celtics. In his second stint with Boston, Horford has proven to be a critical piece, serving as the team's starting center in both the 2021 and 2022 seasons, along with coming up huge for the Celtics in the postseason. He's currently transitioning into a bench role with the team, though, after they acquired Kristaps Porzingis 
in the 2023 offseason. At number four, we have a player who shared the court with Greg Oden at Ohio State and was taken down by Al Horford in the 2007 National Championship game. While Mike Conley was never really up for consideration for the first overall pick, many believe that he was going to be special in the NBA and certainly the first point guard off the board. In college, he was an elite traditional point guard who had a nearly 3-1 to one assist to turnover ratio. The Memphis Grizzlies selected him with the fourth overall pick, and despite being a top five pick, him and Big Booty Lowry still split time at the point guard position his rookie season. Throughout his 12 years with the Grizzlies, Conley became one of the top point guards in the league and one of the most beloved players in Memphis. He fit incredibly well into the grit and grind era of this team, being an incredibly pesky defender on the perimeter and earning himself a spot on the all-defensive team in the 2012 season after averaging 2.2 steals per game. Despite the Grizzlies having a strong roster, they were never really truly title contenders, and in the 2019 offseason after the acquisition of John Morant, it was pretty clear that it was time for a rebuild and Conley was traded to the Utah Jazz. In his second season with the Jazz, he would finally earn his first ever All-Star nod after averaging 16.2 points and 6 assists per game. Conley would be traded for the second time in his career during that 2022 season, this time landing him on the Timberwolves where he has served as the team's starting point guard and main facilitator. They are absolutely killing it right now, by the way, sitting at first place in the Western Conference at the time that I'm recording this video. Due to me not wanting this video to be an hour long, just know I can't spend all day on these guys, but Conley is a great player and has had an amazing career up to this point. That being said, we are going to move on to the fifth overall pick, a player who bounced back from what could have been a career-ending condition to being on a ton of different rosters. Jeff Green was looked at as a guy who could do a little bit of everything, but he was still viewed as a raw talent that would need to be developed once he entered the league. He was a part of the first draft day trade of this class after being selected by the Boston Celtics with the fifth overall pick and then ending up on the Supersonics in order to make room for Ray Allen on the Boston Celtics roster. Green quickly came into his own after his rookie season and started in every game for the next two years, along with seeing a bump in points per game to around 15. But in the middle of the 2000 and 10 season, Green was sent to the Celtics, which fans were not happy about at all since they had to get rid of Kendrick Perkins. After finishing out the season, Green had a major health scare after it was discovered he had an aortic aneurysm that forced him to undergo heart surgery. This surgery kept him sidelined for the entirety of the 2011 season, could have easily cut his career short. However, he came back strong, playing in all but one regular season game that following year. The 2013 season, it appeared that Green was back to 100% after averaging a career-high 16.9 points per game, but yet again, he would be traded soon after this, this time landing himself on the Grizzlies. This was about the time where he really started getting passed around the league. After the Grizzlies, it was the Clippers, Magic, and then we'll pause quickly at the Cavaliers, although it was far from his final team. This would be his first finals appearance. Green would play a huge role for the Cavaliers, but they were clearly outmatched by the loaded Golden State Warriors team and were swept. With LeBron leaving, the Cavs would disperse the roster to other teams, and Green signed with the Wizards, where he played an even bigger role compared to his previous season in Cleveland. After the Wizards, Green Green bounced from the Jazz to the Rockets to the Nets, where he rejoined close friend and former teammate Kevin Durant. He came up huge for the team in Game 5 of the second round playoffs in the 2020 season against the Milwaukee Bucks, where he scored a season-high 27 points and shot 7 for 8 from 3. Green's next adventure was on the Denver Nuggets, where he would win his first championship. He served as an essential bench piece to the team that could score at will any night. As of this season in 2023, he's on the Houston Rockets, where he's seeing the smallest role of his career at the age of 37. Despite being picked just outside of the top five, this next player on our list would only last five seasons in the NBA. He Jin Lian was the first overseas player selected in this draft class, and he entered the league with a lot of question marks to say the least. He had a very unique skill set for a big man at the time, but it was clear he still had a lot of developing to do before he would truly be a difference maker. Scouts thought he could be the next Pau Gasol, but he wouldn't come close to the Lakers legend. Come on now. All right, the Bucks ended up buying into his upside and grabbed him with the sixth overall pick. Despite spending most of his rookie season as the team's starting power forward, he wouldn't be much of a scorer, averaging just 3.3 made field goals per game, which would have been all right, but his defense was not top tier. It wasn't that good at all, actually. 
Surprisingly, he was traded right after his rookie season, though, to the New Jersey Nets, where Gian Lian played a little bit better, but would suffer through a ton of injuries. The best year of his career came in the 2009 season, where he averaged 12 points and 7.2 rebounds per game, while having a 40.3 field goal percentage. In the 2010 offseason, he was sent to the Wizards, where things would continue to go poorly for him, and they would decline to give him a contract extension. As a free agent, he joined the Dallas Mavericks, who were coming off an NBA championship, but struggled to see the floor this season and only played in 30 games for an average of just under seven minutes. Despite being signed by the Lakers before the 2016 season, he asked to be waived from the team to return to China. Honestly, I think his career could have shaped up a lot differently if he really wanted to make it work. There were plenty of times though throughout his career where he just didn't seem very interested in playing. He actually just ended up retiring from Chinese basketball in 2023, but he was a superstar over there. Moving on to the seventh overall pick now, Corey Brewer would become a great defender and have a long NBA career. Scouts looked at him as the premier perimeter defender in this draft class, and he was selected by the Minnesota Timberwolves at number seven. While he didn't do much on the offensive end in his rookie season, he still saw a considerable amount of time on the floor because of his defense. Second season was cut short just after 15 games due to an ACL tear. But he came back from the injury better than ever, averaging what would go on to be a career high in points at 13 per game and starting in all 82 games of that season. Midway through the 2010 season, he was a part of the blockbuster trade that sent Carmelo to the Knicks. Brewer was waived from the Knicks though before playing in a single game for the team and signed with the Dallas Mavericks. And despite not seeing the floor in the finals, Brewer would become an NBA champion after the Mavericks took down the Miami Heat. Before the next season began, Brewer found himself on the Denver Nuggets where he played a much larger role than in Dallas. And in the 2013 offseason, he would make his return to the Timberwolves on a three-year deal. Shockingly, he joined Michael Jordan, Allen Iverson, and Rick Barry as the only players in league history to record 50 points and six-plus steals in one game, which happened against the Rockets on April 11, 2014. Midway through the 2014 season, he was traded from Minnesota again, this time ironically to the Houston Rockets in a three-team deal. He was a great fit in Houston, picking up the slack on defense, but just two seasons later, he started bouncing around the league, from the Lakers to the Thunder to the 76ers, and finally the Kings, where he would finish out his career after playing just 29 games with them. Now, opposite of our last pick, Brewer always gave it 110% on the floor, which is one of the main reasons he lasted 13 years in the league. Despite the 8th overall pick playing mainly a bench role, he would bounce back from a serious injury to have a decade-long run in the league. Brandon Wright played good defense, had a great post game, and was a great rebounder, which led to the Bobcats selecting him with the 8th overall pick. But he was traded to the Warriors on draft night for Jason Richardson and the draft rights to Jamario Davidson. Unfortunately, Wright started his rookie season late due to an injured hip flexor and struggled to see the floor once he made his debut. Things would not improve as he dislocated his left shoulder in his second season, and heading into the 2009 season, he damaged his left shoulder capsule and was forced to undergo surgery that kept him sidelined for the entire year. Wright was still looking unimpressive when he returned from injury and was traded to the Nets. After finishing out the season with the Nets, he signed with the Dallas Mavericks in the beginning of the 2011 season, where he greatly improved as a shot blocker. Midway through the 2014 season, Wright, Jameer Nelson, Jay Crowder, a first-round pick, and a second-round pick were sent to the Boston Celtics for Rajon Rondo and Dwight Powell, but he wouldn't last long in Boston, and near the trade deadline, he was sent to the Phoenix Suns. After the Suns, he found himself on the Grizzlies and finished his career with just one single game on the Rockets. A huge factor of Wright not succeeding in the league was his injuries for sure. He played one season above 70 games. The rest were scattered around, mostly below 40 games though. Moving on to the ninth overall pick is a player who would go on to be arguably the best defender that this class had to offer. Joakim Noah proved himself as one of the top help defenders in all of college basketball leading up to the draft. Along with this, he was looked at as a very talented passer for a center, had an insanely high basketball IQ. 
Many scouts were comparing him to Tyson Chandler, and the Bulls picked him up with the ninth overall pick. It took him some time to take over as the team's starting center, but when he did, both Noah and the Bulls would break out in that 2010 season. Although Noah was forced to miss around the first two months of the year after undergoing surgery for ligament damage in his hand, once he returned, he played a key piece in Chicago's run to the Eastern Conference Finals, where they fell to the Heat in five games. The best season of his time with the Bulls and career as a whole would come in the 2013 season, where he averaged 12.6 points, 11.3 rebounds, 5.4 assists, and 1.5 blocks per game, earning him his second straight All-Star appearance, first All-NBA appearance, and the Defensive Player of the Year award. Noah lasted two more years with the Bulls before signing a huge contract with the Knicks four years, $72 million. This would end up being Knicks fans' worst nightmare as injuries would plague his career from then on. Noah only played in 53 games during his two years with the team and then was cut from the team leading up to the 2018 season, but would quickly sign with the Memphis Grizzlies where he played in just 42 games. Noah would end up playing out his final season of his career with the Clippers in the 2019 season. I'll go on the record right now to say Joakim Noah was slept on heavily, but you know, I can't leave this section without mentioning his lovely shooting form. Oh yeah, competing. <laughs> Fun to watch. Joakim Noah by himself, shot won't fall. Rounding out the top 10 picks, we have a player who many fans dislike not only because he let them down on the court, but also because he wanted his team to move cities entirely. As a prospect, Spencer Hawes was looked at as a big man with excellent footwork and who was a very talented passer as well. Sacramento Kings selected him with the 10th overall pick, but he spent most of his rookie season coming off the bench. He continued to work his way up the rotation throughout his three years with the Kings, but was traded to the 76ers in the 2010 offseason. Now, during his time with the Kings, as we mentioned just a little bit ago, he made it very clear he wanted the whole team to move to Seattle, which was his hometown, and this certainly upset the fans in Sacramento. While on the 76ers, he started in all 81 games that he played in during his first season, but he would begin coming off the bench more and more in the following two seasons. During the 2013 season, Hawes was dealt to the Cavs and would end up on the Clippers, Hornets, and Bucks throughout the rest of his career. Towards the tail end of his career, Hawes transitioned into a power forward role compared to the center role where he played during his first nine years. He did a much better job spacing the floor at power forward, but that didn't necessarily mean more playing time for him. In fact, it was actually much less after he switched. All right, everybody, I am going to be totally real with you guys. I wrote down 26 names to talk about in this video. We are only on number 11 and it's 20 minutes in, so I'm not going to just make this a 50 minute video. What I'm going to do is kind of speed run through the guys who didn't do too much in the league and talk a little bit more about the players who did later on in this draft, but quickly, these videos take a lot of time, guys. If you could just hit that subscribe button for me, if you enjoy watching him, I would appreciate it so, so much. And also drop a thumbs up on this video. We're talking about AC Law next at number 11, Texas A&M legend right here. He was insanely clutch, but unfortunately his career didn't really work out in the NBA. He struggled to find his shot a lot of the time and ended up retiring following the 2010 season to play overseas. At number 12, Thaddeus Young. Overall, just a very solid career. He made the all-rookie team. He's actually still playing at 35 years old. He's only seeing about four minutes per game right now and averaging under two points with the Toronto Raptors, so I'm not sure how much longer he's going to be in the league. Number 13, Julian Wright. Just an overall bust. There's no other way to put it. He went on to have a successful overseas career, though, but just did not work out for him in the NBA. Now, we're going to jump around a little bit so stay with me Rodney Stuckey at number 15 one of the most slept on ball handlers that I have ever seen he was snatching ankles taking names he played a key role in the Pistons organization in the early 2010s and definitely was an overall solid player but had to retire early at 30 years old due to some injuries and then never being given a chance again. At number 16, Swaggy P over here. He's probably most known for his incident with D'Angelo Russell. D'Lo ended up recording Young, admitting that he cheated on his then fiance Iggy Azalea. And ever since then, Nick Young has hated his guts. He actually came out last year and said that he wanted to box D'Angelo Russell, but Russell came out and said that he's just using his name for clout. So, here we are. 
Nick Young was a great three-point shooter, but he's definitely most known for that drama with D'Lo. Oh, and let's not forget, NBA champion with the Golden State Warriors. Up at number 18, Marco Bellinelli, the first ever Italian player in league history to become an NBA champion with the San Antonio Spurs. Up at number 22, Jared Dudley, another guy with just a solid overall career. You can't put it any other way. He became a champion in the 2019 season when he was far past his prime, let's just say that. He was mainly a locker room guy and an honorary coach for the Lakers, but they took down the Heat in six games to give him his first title. Then he would retire after one more season with the team, but that's a hell of a way to end off your career. 23rd, Wilson Chandler, who was teammates with Melo for a while. He ended up going to China, actually, during the NBA lockout to play with the Zhejiang Wangsha Lions. Ended up playing with them after his retirement as well, but was also suspended for PED use in the beginning of the 2019 season. Now, that might have came off like I was downplaying Wilson Chandler's achievements because of the PED usage, and that's just not the case. He was overall a good player, but we just don't have all day to talk about him. At number 24, we had Rudy Fernandez. Got off to a hot start in his rookie season, averaging 10.4 points, 2.7 rebounds, and 2 assists with the Trailblazers, which he made the all-rookie team, but then it was just all downhill from there. He was not happy in the league, and after his NBA career, he would head back to Spain, where I believe he's actually still playing to this day coming to number 27 i have to give a shout out to aaron aflalo he was an overall solid shooter he played his best basketball with the orlando magic though in the early 2010s also at the 28th pick i gotta give a quick shout out to tiago splitter for winning a title in 2014 with the Spurs. Now jump into pick number 35, Big Baby Davis, Glenn Davis, won the 2008 NBA Finals with the Boston Celtics, but clearly was not happy with how that situation played out, and he still is not happy with Doc Rivers to this day, even though he would go on to join the Clippers, who were coached by Doc Rivers later on in his career. But since then, like I said, he is just not happy about that situation, calls that title lucky as hell for Doc Rivers to win it. All right, I bet you guys didn't see this one coming. San Yu, 10 games played with the Lakers, one-time NBA champion, absolute beast. But the 48th pick here was probably the biggest steal of the draft. I have to take a moment and talk more in depth about Marc Gasol. He was overlooked by scouts leading up to the draft, and he slid all the way to pick 48, where the Lakers would end up picking him. He ended up missing what would have been his rookie season to finish out his contract in Spain, and in that time, he was traded to the Memphis Grizzlies in a deal that sent his brother, Pau Gasol, to the Los Angeles Lakers. Gasol would get his chance to let his game develop a little bit more in Memphis than he would have in Los Angeles, and he would end up being an elite pairing alongside Mike Conley. He made his first All-Star appearance in the 2011 season and took home the Defensive Player of the Year award in the following season. Gasol would pick up two more All-Star appearances in his 11-year run with Memphis, but the roster was really missing that true superstar that could bring them a title. The 2018 season, he was traded to the Raptors, where he went on to play a crucial role in their championship winning run over the Golden State Warriors that season. After one more season in Toronto, he tried to get another ring in LA with the Lakers, but it would be a very disappointing season and he would retire from the league after the 2020 season. Now at number 51, have to throw it in here, James on Curry. All right, I know it's James on Curry, but we had to throw that name in there. Okay, moving on. Pick number 56, Ramon Sessions. Although he started out slow in his career, he ended up in the D-League in his rookie season. He came back roaring, and he was a great draft pick at number 56. He spent time playing for a ton of different teams, ended up on the Lakers, the Bobcats, the Bucks, the Kings, the Wizards, the Hornets, the Knicks, and then back to the Wizards. This man was all over the place. But as you can probably tell by the amount of names we covered in this draft class, it was certainly something special. You know what else is special? That 2006 draft class that we talked about in the last video, but for all the opposite reasons. Make sure you guys go click that video and find out exactly why that is. 